Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we would in such wise read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your word that we may embrace and that hold fast the blessed hope of life eternal. Amen. Well, we're with Prof. Hughes's um, Faith and Works. And he's talking, giving an introduction here. He's talking about Cranmer. And now we have we'll talked about the third homily of the, in the homilies. The third homily in the Edwardian book is a careful exposition of the New Testament teaching concerning justification. It displays the settled judgment, it's a good word, at which Cranmer had arrived at this important issue in 1547. From the opening affirmation of the universal sinfulness of mankind, he draws the conclusion that therefore can no man by his own acts, works, but deeds, seem they never be so good, be justified before God. I should reach for my yellow highlighter here. Um, it's pretty well stated there by Dr. Kramer. Excuse me for a second. Uh, this is clear Reformation teaching in contradistinction to the Council of Trent, which still dominates, controls, and governs uh, the, the, the outfit from Rome. I don't know what else to call it. I'm going to call it the church, but it's a half Christ, a half church, with a super Peter. Peter. Never underestimate the people who embrace false teaching. Accordingly, another righteousness must be sought, which comes not from man, but from God. Namely, that which we receive by God's mercy and Christ's merits, and which is embraced by faith, is taken, accepted, and allowed of God for our perfect and full justification. The believer's justification rests upon the double foundation, firstly, that Christ's perfection, the perfection of Christ's life, is as, as he faultlessly fulfilled the will of God. And secondly, the satisfaction made for our sins by Christ on the cross. The ransom provided by God for us was the most precious body and blood of his most dear son and beloved son, Jesus Christ, who had fulfilled the law for us perfectly. It was in this way that the justice of God and his mercy did embrace together and fulfilled the mystery of our redemption. Three passages are cited from Romans, the epistle by Paul to show the three things which are must go together upon God's part, his great mercy and grace upon Christ's part. That is the satisfaction of, the, of God's justice or the price of our redemption by the offering of his body and blood, by the fulfilling of the law perfectly, thoroughly. For and on our part, a true and living faith. It's evident then that the grace of God doth not shut up the justice of God in our justification, but only shutteth out the justice of man, that is to say, the justice of our works, as by the merits of deserving our justification. Cranmer is perfectly confident that to affirm that Christ is now the righteousness of all that truly believe in him, precisely because, quote, he paid for them the ransom by his death, and he fulfilled the law in his life. After drawing attention to numerous other New Testament passages, Cranmer calls in the testimony of the church's patristic authors, quote, after this wise to be justified, only by this true and lively faith, Cranmer asserts, speak all the old and ancient authors, both Greek and Latin. And having given quotations from Hilary, Basel, Ambrose, 
Origen, Chrysostom, Cyprian, Augustine, Prosper, Ecumenius, Photius, Bernard, and Anselm, and many other authors. This leads Cranmer to state confidently, the faith of the Holy Scripture justifieth. This is the strong rock and foundation of Christian religion. This doctrine of the old and ancient authors of Christ's church do approve. This doctrine advances and setteth forth the true glory of Christ and beateth down the vain glory of man. And you can see, I'm going to interject here with Cal or Cranmer, that where this dominates in the soul and mind, you cannot go to Trent and say anything but that it is a vainglorious and pompous system. It's camouflaged. Reformers really saw that. And today, this is basically almost a lost, lost doctrine. Excuse me. Back to Cranmer, that whosoever denieth is not counted as a true Christian man, nor a setter forth of Christ's glory, but for the adversary of Christ and his gospel, and a setter forth of man's glory. Back to Hughes now. At the same time, Cranmer is careful to explain that justification by faith alone does not imply exclusion of good works from the Christian life. The saving faith, he says, quote, does not shut out repentance, hope, love, dread, and the fear of God to be joined with faith in every man that is justified, but it shutteth them out from the office of justifying, close quote. Indeed, it is beyond all question, Cranmer goes on, that we are most bounden to serve God in doing good deeds, commanded by him in his holy scripture all the days of our lives. No more did the patristic writers in teaching this doctrine mean that we should or might afterward be idle, and that we should do no good works, or that we should no do good works at all, their intention simply was to take away all merit of our works as being able to deserve the justification at God's hands. For what anyone professed to be a believer in Christ's disciple, when he liveth ungodly and denieth Christ in his deeds, is a dreadful contradiction. It can only be concluded that a professed faith which bringeth forth without repentance either evil good works or no good works is not a right one. Pure and lively faith, but is dead, devilish, counterfeit, a feigned faith, as St. Paul and St. James call it. It must not be imagined, however, that genuine, lively faith is itself the ground of justification or kind of act of deserving. Such faith is our response to the grace of God freely offered us in Christ. It is the opposite and the end of self-reliance. For it putteth us from itself and from itself and remitteth and appointeth unto us Christ only. Or to have him by remission of sins and justification. It is, Cranmer points out, as though our very faith in Christ says to us, it is not I that take away your sins, but it's Christ only. And to him only I send you for that purpose, forsaking therein all good virtues, words, thoughts, and works, and only putting trust in Christ. This third homily, in a special way, to the official teaching of the Church of England, it belongs to the Church of England, but not only has a place in the first book of homilies, which was authorized for use in the parishes under Edward and Elizabeth, but it's also particularly referred to in the Articles of Religion as the accepted declaration of justification. This reference is found in the 11th 
of the 42 Articles of 1553, which was then limited to the brief statement. Justification by only faith in Christ, in the sense as declared in the homily of justification, is a most certain and wholesome doctrine of Christian men. Close quote. It was in 1571 that the Articles were finally shaped and sanctioned as the 39 Articles of the Church of England. But Article 11 was expanded in the form in which it has come down to us in the earlier Elizabethan Ascension of 1563 to read as follows. We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith and not for our own works or deservings. Wherefore, we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and full of comfort the more largely is expressed in the homily of justification. So we have it, the third homily on salvation, justification by works uh, in Cranmer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us ever to see with great clarity, intensity of thought and great comprehension the magnificence of your life, Jesus, for us, by which we are justified.